Estates. I began by asking the Finance Minister about projections that 150,000 people will lose their jobs in the, a tough year ahead. Yeah, and look, obviously that's a result of Treasury's view that the economy is slowing down, and that's a global trend. Uh, that is their forecast and projection. I always regard it as a part of my job to be able to limit that. We are in a slowing economy, and unfortunately one of the results of that is that more people may well become unemployed. Yeah, and we're also in a inflationary period, so while people might be treading water right now in their jobs and hanging on, sort of making ends meet, uh, it can be devastating. It will be devastating for those people and their families uh, if they are made unemployed in this environment. Oh, very much. I mean, and as I say, one of the jobs I've all taken very seriously the whole time I've been finance minister is to keep as many people in work as possible. And we're we're coming into the slowing economy with unemployment at 3.4 percent. That's a much better starting point than what we thought we might be when it came to COVID. But. You know, we have to try and make sure we help people get through this. There are better days ahead. Um, and the Treasury's forecasts also show that wages will outpace inflation as we go through the next period of time. So, yes, a difficult period for New Zealanders, but actually light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, how sure are you about the measures, the borrowing and the spending that you've announced yesterday, that that is not going to be inflationary? Have you run the ruler right over that? We certainly have. And Treasury based their forecasts on our... Uh, investments and so they're saying that inflation will come down to 3.3% next year and then 2.5% the year after. Particularly on the cost of living, we actually went looking for initiatives that we thought would ease pressure on people but not exacerbate inflation unduly and that's why you see those more targeted things around ECE, um, the public transport, those sorts of things because we wanted to ease the cost of living pressure but an untargeted tax cut, for example, would have the risk of being quite inflationary. So we've worked hard on that, um, and Treasury's forecasts show that actually it will see inflation come down. So with that uh, ECE uh, subsidy now being extended to two-year-olds, that's around $7,000 a year for a family, using your average of around $133 a week. Where does that money go? Well, that'll go to a lot of other pressures that they've got. And you know, one of the things we certainly heard from people is the price of food is a massive issue for them. It's very hard for a government to get to the price of food. Um, we're doing that with the work we're doing in supermarket reform, but that takes time. So what this does is relieve pressure, so it's not in injecting extra money into somebody's pocket necessarily. What it's saying is we're going to help you shift your expenditure around, help you be able to deal with other cost of living issues while reducing this. It's also worth pointing out on the ECE that it doesn't come in until March next year. Now I know for some people that's disappointing. There's a lot of administrative reasons for that. It's also true to say that by it being March next year, this immediate period where inflation is an issue, that money won't be coming into the economy. How sure are you that inflation has now peaked? Because banks seem generally sceptical about this. Um, and the opposition says that the government's investment, you would say, they say addiction to spending, it, it, it will be inflationary. Yeah, look, I mean, the old story, if you put, you know, 10 economists in a room, you'll get 13 opinions. You know, it's, it's forecasting's hard. Treasury's forecasts actually hold up pretty well when you compare them to others, but they're independent forecasts. They do them without the government's involvement. For me, as the Minister of Finance, I have to use them. I don't have an option. I can't pick another another forecast. But and so I have to rely on... Yeah, I do believe inflation's peaked, and I actually think most economists think inflation's peaked. The question that they're asking is how quickly does it come down? Well, that's the, um, the other player in, this, in, in the inflation cycle, I suppose, is the Reserve Bank, and economists saying... Uh, since the budget, that this may give the Reserve Bank Governor Adrian Orr pause, that he may now uh, do two more rate hikes rather than just the one that we were expecting. I don't think there's any cause for that in the budget numbers that are here today. I mean, when you actually look at the extra spending that we're doing, uh, you know, in terms of cost of living type stuff, it's modest. Um, the Reserve Bank will make its own decisions independent. It also has to take into account much more than the, what the government's spending is. They have to look at the overall economy, issues to do with, you know, the supply chain, immigration, 
wage pressure, all of that, but we have taken our decisions based on the fact that we wanted to make sure we weren't putting undue pressure on inflation, and the Treasury forecasts do show that. It sounds like you're telegraphing that you don't think it's necessary. It's, as I say, it's totally up to him, but I'm just saying we have thought about that on the process that we've been through. The big difference we do have between what we did, what we were saying at the end of last year and now, is the cyclone and the impact of that. And I think all New Zealanders would want us to be able to support people through that. Does the left hand know what the right hand is doing between the government and the Reserve Bank? Because it seems like you're moving in slightly different directions. You have the same goal, but Adrian Orr is trying to crush inflation, and you seem to be taking a slightly softer approach with what you're doing in government. I think what we do is mutually supportive, and um, when you actually look at uh, the, the Treasury's um, budget. Is it, no, it is, it is. If you let me give you one example. Within the Treasury's budget, economic and fiscal update, you'll see a measure of government consumption. That's going down 5%. It's already started going down, and it's going down 5% um, up until the end of 2024. So we are, we're taking that COVID spending that we did out of the economy, which supports the direction of travel of the Reserve Bank. So I believe they are mutually reinforcing. Are they conflicting, though? What you're doing? No, they're not. They're not conflicting. We just have slightly different roles in the economy. But from the point of view of the Reserve Bank, their job is to get inflation back down to one to three percent over the medium term. What the Treasury forecasts show is that that happens. So I do believe they're mutually reinforcing. Treasury also shows, uh, as a result of yesterday's budget, that interest rates are likely to stay higher for longer. And that is taking money out of New Zealanders' pockets too, isn't it? Yeah, so it's very important we know what they mean when they say higher for longer, because they mean higher for longer from the forecast we had in December. Which is higher for longer. Yeah, yeah. But that is a result of what happened between December and now, which is the cyclone and the flood events. And they say that very specifically in the budget. Does this As, budget also have an impact? Well, some of our response to the cyclone may have some of an impact, but actually it's more about what happens within the demand in the economy to recover and rebuild from the cyclone. Well, another area of interest for Kiwis at home will be housing. What is the outlook for housing exactly? Because we have some worrying figures for homeowners in amongst... Yeah, well, obviously everybody's been seeing um, the decline in house prices over the last little while, and it had clearly got unsustainably high. Um, but clearly for people who borrowed money during the last couple of years, this is a difficult period of time because they borrowed at very low interest rates. We're clearly at higher interest rates at the moment. And they paid high prices. They did as well. And it was a very, you know, so for that group of buyers um, and mortgage holders, it is a very challenging time. Overall, the picture around housing, I mean, the bit that the government's core responsibility is, which is the building of state houses, public houses, we've got further investment here and that out to 2025. And I think that's an area where the government can just justifiably be proud of what we've done. I want to come back to those people that, we, that you were just talking about who have borrowed at high prices, low interest rates and now facing much higher hikes and a falling market. They've really been caught out in this cycle, haven't they? I don't know about caught out, but they've certainly been caught up um, in it. And, you know, one of the things that banks do when they lend money is they, is they stress test borrowers above the rate at which they borrow, because we all know that there's the potential for that. So that's part of being factored in. It will put pressure on those households, but if the stress testing works properly, it shouldn't lead them to, you know, a mortgagee sale or anything like that. So I'm not denying the pressure on those households. Um, there are better times to come. Inflation is coming down, mortgage rates will come down. But yeah, if you've borrowed in the last couple of years, and I, you know, I among many other people was asked about that a lot, and I can recall standing here in Parliament and saying to reporters, yes, if you're borrowing now, always remember the rate at which you're borrowing now will not be the rate that you repay your mortgage at. Do, what is happening in terms of a government review of the economic decisions that were taken during COVID that many people will say in part led to these high house prices led to this inflationary environment that we're in. Will the government hold that review so that we can see what was good and what was bad? I feel yeah, like there's absolutely. been... Absolutely. Um, I mean, that's happening. That's what the Royal Commission's when? doing. When? So the Royal Commission's getting itself underway right now, um, and within the terms of reference for the Royal Commission that we've already agreed is the government's economic response, including the monetary policy response. What I would say, though, is that 
we don't get the luxury of governing in hindsight. And I get the fact that we should definitely do a review and definitely learn lessons, but I stand by the decisions we made. I, I genuinely believe we saved tens of thousands of lives and we kept businesses afloat. Now, people will be able to make their judgments when we do go and do that review, but in the moment, we don't have that benefit of hindsight, and I stand by what we did. But it is important to look back it and is. to learn lessons, because Absolutely. there will be things that, that other governments may be able to carry yes. forward, and it also provides some accountability and transparency. I totally agree, and that's why we're having the Royal Commission. So why has it taken so long? Oh, well, you know, we had to get through COVID. I mean, one of the things I remember, there were calls to sort of start it when we were in the middle of it, and the very same people who you need to be involved in the review, we're doing the actual work. It is underway, and it's a big job. And if you look around the world, most countries are taking their time to do it thoroughly. Um, and I do expect that it should be a thorough job, and I do expect to be held accountable. Is it also politics? Because this will happen after the election. I just think it takes the time it takes. And when is it supposed to report back? I believe it's in 2024. Um, obviously, I'm not day-to-day -day responsible. I want to talk about another issue which is facing households, which is, you mentioned it briefly before, which is the cost of food. Is there really nothing that you could do or find to bring some relief in that uh, area for Kiwis? We've taken the position that we're much better off supporting people in the here and now with their incomes, but addressing the underlying issues. And supermarket competition is that. And so the work that we're doing on opening up, for example, um, the covenants on land, getting rid of those, making sure that new entrants into the market can get into the wholesale end of the market. But those changes will take time. That's but all long-term stuff. Yeah, they are the ones that will have the fundamental difference. But it's not going to make a fundamental difference. Any short-term measure that, that we've looked at does not necessarily do that. There would be a way of doing it. You could take GST off absolutely all food. But I think that would start another debate about whether you should take it off takeaways or not. Other countries have had this. Is a cooked chicken or a frozen chicken? You know, you end up in these sorts of debates when actually you can do more by delivering support to people's incomes while getting those competition issues right. So is that something that you've looked at? Well, it used to be Labour Party policy once upon a time <laughs> um, to take for GST off fresh fruit and vegetables, and it's, it just doesn't deliver the difference. And to be frank, if it's low- and middle-income households, you know, there are better ways of us delivering support to them, which is what we've done. And can they expect more support towards the election? Election policy hasn't been set yet. This is the budget period of time. I think we've done... You'll be working on it right of now, course though. We are, but, 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 but we've been focused on delivering a budget that delivers what I think is the right package at this time. We'll get into an election campaign. People will make their promises. What I would say as the Minister of Finance is the amount of discretionary spending available out of this budget for future years is not that large. The budget allowances that we've got, which we've increased a little bit, are largely there to meet cost pressures. And so anyone making promises in the election campaign has to be able to show how they're going to pay for it. Sounds like a challenge to the opposition there. Um, that does beg the question, though, if there are more savings to be found within government. You've, you've found $4 billion pretty easily, but is, is there... <laughs> Well, is there more there, though? Is the public service value for money in its entirety? Because households are making big changes to their budgets. Can the government well, do that, more? That's exactly what we did. And while you say it was easy, I can, I can assure you it wasn't. Um, I always think we can do more. Yeah. And, and one of the things we did in this budget was say to ministers, if you're looking for new funding, you've got to come back to us first and say... What efficiencies can you find? What savings can you find? And we're going to keep that program going. And I do think we can look at lots of things that can improve the way that government services work. So do I think... Do you need to be a bit more ruthless out there? In... I think we need to be more efficient. I think the problem with being ruthless, in inverted commas, is that the big sums of money that people are looking for ultimately I don't think are there. There are definitely improvements, but the kind of big sums that would pay for tax cuts, for example, I, I'd be challenged to find those, and I think what re the reality of that is, is cuts to services to pay for it, rather than efficiencies. I think, and I don't know, I'm not an economist, but I think I might have found a hole in your budget. Oh. <laughs> I think it could be a $1.8 billion hole, but it's in projected revenue from tobacco. It's still there in 2025, even though that revenue presumably 
So obviously, the, obviously, this is within the Treasury's forecast, which they do independently of the government. We don't, we don't do those. So you found the whole term. What, what the Treasury have told us is that yeah, they have recognised the idea that there'll be a declining revenue from um, tobacco, but they also factor in inflation within that. So while yes, they expect that you know fewer people will be smoking, some of the costs that the people who are still smoking are paying will be going up. So that's the so explanation they've given us for those forecasts. Do you buy it? Well, I have to, and and actually, I do think the Treasury understand what the government policy is, and they have factored in that decline. It's just to get slightly balanced out. Okay, okay. Well, let's hope so. But, but good on you for finding it. Well, we've got a long time in that lockup. Um, <laughs> there's also $14 million in the budget for MP security. How is that going to be spent, and, and, and can you talk to me a little bit about why that's necessary? So that is for the parliamentary service to decide, the people who organise the lives of, of parliamentarians. It's not just for security of MPs' offices, it's also around this building here uh, and how we do all of our work. Unfortunately, there have been a lot greater number of threats for MPs and journalists and others in public life. And and so that's a recognition from the parliamentary service that they need to do a bit more to support us and our electorate officers. We all have offices around town where um, people are there, sometimes on their own, um, so we need to provide support for our staff, as well as this building here. We saw during the occupation what could happen. So it's a very unfortunate fact of life that we do need to provide better security. And how do you feel about that personally? You've been an MP a long time. Yeah, I've spoken about that before. I mean, I've, as the local MP here in Wellington Central during the occupation, that was a frightening time for my constituents um, and equally you know there were threats made to MPs during that period of time it's something we have to deal with it's not a pleasant thing to have to deal with but I think taking precautions and investing a bit of money in that is the right thing to do